Well, hello everybody and welcome to our first lecture in a couple of weeks now. Uh, we'll talk about Latin America today and we'll start by looking at a map of what we're considering Latin America. Uh, for our purposes, anything below the Rio Grande River, so from Mexico and below is what we're calling Latin America. That's what we'll be going over all of on this lecture. And to talk about it, it's we got to say that it's tough to talk about because the area is so diverse. Follow along with the mouse here. Uh, so this area, this state, uh, Brazil, is actually, they speak Portuguese in Brazil. Most of the rest of the continents speaks Spanish, and it has to, it goes back to the, to the 16th century when the uh, Portuguese and the Spanish were exploring in the New World. <clears throat> and they decided that, uh, well, the Pope decided actually that from about here down was Portugal's territory to the east and to the west was the rest was Spain. Portugal was okay with it because they didn't know how big the continent actually was, kind of hilariously. But then that's for the most part. So keep in mind, though, that there are hundreds, if not thousands, of indigenous languages. And when we talk about those indigenous languages, we're thinking things like uh, the old Mayan language, <clears throat> what they would have spoken, or Nuatl, uh, the old Aztec language, what they would speak there. Uh, so keep in mind as we go along here that this is one diverse area, uh, and we can't make too many generalizations about the whole continent, but we're going to, uh, for our purposes here, if you want to know a lot more about it, Dr. Valella in the History Department teaches uh, on Latin America a lot more extensively, and you can find out some more differences going that route. So I encourage you to do that. <clears throat> Moving along, we'll get to... Oh, Latin America before World War II, and when we say that, they are a politically independent uh, region, mostly. There are some instances uh, after the 1820s and 1830s where they aren't, everybody isn't so politically independent, but for the most part, uh, they have achieved independence from their European colonial overlords, and we saw in Africa that that wasn't the case, even up into the 20th century and in Asia, that wasn't the case, even up into the 19, 1900s, but by the 1820s, 1830s, uh, most Latin American countries were independent from Spain and Portugal and others. Some, there's some French and British possessions down there, too, uh, which comes up in the 1980s, Britain's possessions, which is kind of a tricky situation. But we'll get there towards the end of this year. And what we say is that their independence movements were a little bit different than North America. Uh, there is a bit of a, a language difference. Um, uh, Spanish, French, and Portuguese are the major languages in Latin America, mostly Spanish and Portuguese, a little bit of English here and there. Uh, there's more interaction between different ethnic groups. Intermarriage, for example, was a lot more typical in Latin America than it had been in North America. Uh, there are racial codes put into place in North America that prevent that kind of thing from happening. But in Latin America, uh, the majority ethnic group uh, in most places is Mestizo, and Mestizo is a mixture of native indigenous populations with Europeans. Uh, when you think of Hispanics today, you probably think of a, uh, and not to get too into race and skin color or whatever, because they are sometimes made up situations, but the mestizos are sort of a darker skin. So they look like they're they're very tan most of the time. Uh, again, not to be not to sound racist about it, but that's a, a mixture of indigenous populations with Europeans, and that is a lot more common in Latin America than it ever was in North America. So that's something else. Uh, to keep in mind. And they are also economically dependent on uh, on other countries. Uh, most of these countries have one or two major exports uh, that they relied on mainly, and they use that to buy manufactured goods. So these are mostly, uh, in general, we can say that they're farming communities if or farming countries, if anything else. They have one major export, and we'll get into some examples as we go along here. Uh, there is a bit of an increase in influence during World War II in Latin America. Uh, if we take a U.S. history class, we'll learn about the, the good neighbor policy instituted by Franklin Roosevelt. And it was a good neighbor policy in the sense that the U.S. got what they wanted, but Latin America didn't always get what they wanted. Uh, but what it meant was that <clears throat> excuse me, the United States got access to raw materials, uh, and they really wanted to make sure that they stayed on the Allied side, that is, with... Uh, the United States and Great Britain and the Soviet Union. Brazil was actually the only country in Latin America to send soldiers uh, to fight in the war. And the other countries uh, remained on the Allied side for the most part, uh, but they didn't send as many, nearly as many soldiers uh, to fighting. But they supported uh, 
in other ways. So that good neighbor policy uh, was instrumental to that whole keeping Latin America in the U.S. sphere of influence uh, during the war. After the war, though, uh, what forms in the Americas, uh, in North and South America, is called this Organization of American States, primarily to keep them on the American side again during the Cold War. Uh, the United States cares a whole heck of a lot about keeping countries from falling to communism, this bipolar world that we live in, everybody has to choose sides. So it, the, in, the United States really um, takes an interest in keeping most Latin American countries in the American sphere of influence. And that policy meant that the United States was oftentimes willing to support what we're going to call less than democratic systems of governments, as long as it meant that that state, whichever state in particular, didn't go to communism. When we say less than democratic, we mean military dictatorships in a lot of these areas. And we'll talk about how many there actually are in Latin America over the course of the 20th century. Uh, the number one priority for the United States is to, to stay anti-communism, to keep the hemisphere anti-communist. And the first example we'll go over here is Guatemala. And Guatemala has a military dictator in World War II who was socialist leaning, uh, but not completely communist. But he ended up being removed in 1950 democratically. Uh, this guy, Jacobo Guzman, was elected, or I have his name, Jacobo Arbenz Guzman, was elected democratically to take his place. He was not a communist by any means, but he did have some radical ideas, including uh, land reform, which to the United States sounded an awful lot like communism. And so it really comes to a head when what this company called the United Fruit Company that still exists today. Uh, before the war, had owned about 42% of all available lands in uh, Guatemala, and after and pretty much everything uh, that was involved with infrastructure, roads, railroads in the country was owned by the United Fruit Company. Uh, part of Jacobo Guzman's land reform was taking pa taking back that territory and that infrastructure, those infrastructure uh, things like railroads and roads in general. And so part of his land reform was taking that back and giving it to his people. So he's not really a communist, but the United States doesn't like him because those are sort of communist ideals. You remember uh, Mao with his land reforms, uh, creating those giant farms with 50,000 people on them, or the Soviet Union when they come, come into power and they have these massive land reform ideas. So it land reform usually to the United States means communism. So they were not very happy with Jacobo Guzman, even though he was democratically elected in Guatemala. So what ends up happening is the CIA launches a force of about 200 men in 1954. There's also a massive bombing campaign and they take control, the United States takes control of the, the national radio broadcasts. Uh, Guzman ended up fleeing the country and a military dictatorship took over him, which led to the civil war uh, that lasted from about the 1960s to the 1990s. Uh, mostly, it was indigenous Mayans against the, the rest of the country, if you will. Uh, so that was the civil war there, and that's something that might be mirrored in a couple other countries as we go along here. So by the time we get to the 1950s, after the war in Latin America, there are some economic changes going on. And the first one we talk about is the import substituting industrialization and that is kind of what it sounds like. They would substitute imports uh, in lieu of industrialization around the country. So Latin America never really industrializes in this early earlier period uh, like the rest of the world was trying to do at this time. Uh, the, most of the West, if you will, had been industrialized for a little while now, but developing nations, developing continents, uh, places in Asia, places in Africa were working on industrialization uh, during this time frame so we also get this neglect in the agricultural sector, uh, which ends up forcing Latin American countries to rely more and more on imports to just feed themselves. Uh, and it can all be attributed to this growing problem. Uh, these nations had been independent for a long time, but the United States plays a huge influence on their policies and which directions they're heading. Um, and it, it leads to some growing problems, even though they are rather old countries by this point. The next major topic we're going to get to here is the Cuban Revolution, and we had talked about the revolution, or we had talked about Cuba before, but we're going to have to go back in time just a, a little bit here uh, to talk about the revolution, because the last time we heard about Cuba, Castro was already in, in charge. But we're going to go back just a little bit here 
and begin with Fulgencio Batista, who had been the dictator of Cuba since 1952. Uh, he was in power before World War II, but during the war he removed himself from power uh, for complicated reasons. But by 52, 1952, he's back in charge, and he builds up the country, the, the economic power of the country, uh, through sugar and tourism. Uh, before the Cuban Revolution, Cuba had been a huge tourist destination for many wealthy and middle-class Americans. They liked to go, go down there. There was a lot of gambling that went on in Cuba. There was, uh, you think of it sort of like a Las Vegas or just a resort area in general. Uh, interestingly, there's a huge mob, uh, mafia influence in Cuba before the revolution, and Batista was fine with it because he was paid off by the mafia. I try to think of an example in Boardwalk Empire, uh, Nucky Thompson and some of his compatriots go down to Cuba to start working on some stuff. So that's, think of those mafia guys down there working on the Cubans. Uh, so Cuba had for a long time been uh, this huge tourist destination for the United States. Uh, and I, I expect now that Cuba's opened back up to American uh, travel, that it might become again a huge tourist destination. So you better get there while you can. I hope too soon. Uh, so what ends up happening, though, is that he is a very repressive guy and he's not popular with the Cuban people. Uh, so there's a revolutionary movement led by Fidel Castro. His picture's at the top right there uh, with his famous, famous beard. Uh, so what ends up happening is that Castro uh, comes in in 1959 and leads the revolution. He had been in exile in Mexico uh, for quite a few years at this point. Uh, so he comes in and the revolution takes place and Castro wins. Uh, the United States had supported Batista in another case of the U.S. supporting less than democratic guys as long as they weren't communists. Uh, but Castro was a communist. Uh, they take over and there's land reform policies taking place in Cuba. After the revolution, uh, Cuba comes to have this command economy, which remember from the Soviet Union, they had a command economy too. Uh, what he does is, what Castro does is improve overall quality of life in Cuba, but most people were just above the poverty line, so nobody's really getting super affluence with Castro in charge, not that they were with Batista in charge either, uh, but he is popular. He comes in, uh, he has to fight a civil war, but it's he's a popular revolutionary. And then that's, so that's where Cuba stays even today. Uh, Castro just died very recently, but his brother is in charge right now of Cuba. So that's the system that still exists in Cuba today. And so the rest of Latin America in the 1960s and 70s is, for the most part, trying to emulate what happened in Cuba. Uh, Castro, as a good communist, and if we go to communist ideology, part of it is trying to spread the revolution. Castro wants to spread the revolution to the rest of the continents. So there are guerrilla movements in uh, that try to emulate C Castro's revolution in places like Colombia and Venezuela, Peru, and Guatemala. Uh, che Guevara, for his part, you all know him as a symbol of consumer culture for some reason, which he absolutely would hate. So anybody who's wearing a t-shirt with Che's face on it, uh, just know that he probably wouldn't want you, not probably, he definitely wouldn't want you to be wearing that t-shirt. Uh, he was absolutely against it. But he gets killed uh, fighting in Bolivia, trying to spread uh, the revolution, the communist revolution, throughout the continent in 1967. <clears throat> so that's kind of what's going on through the 60s and 70s in a lot of these countries. Not to say that there's a revolution happening everywhere, uh, but there are attempts at reform across the, the continents to try and curb some of these revolutions from taking place. Uh, but these reforms, in large part, end up leading to a bunch of military dictatorships. Uh, some numbers here. In 1960, four of the 20 countries in Latin America uh, were led by military dictatorships. Uh, by 1980, only four of these 20 countries did not have military dictatorships. Uh, so that's kind of an alarmingly large number, alarmingly large percentage of these countries uh, with military dictatorships. And just to kind of put some more numbers on it, between 1962 and 1966, there were nine military dictators who committed coup d'etats, what are known as coup d'etats, to overthrow the current government and install themselves uh, between 66 or b between 62 and 1966. Uh, one of these examples we're going to go over here is in Argentina. Uh, so, in Argentina, between 1930 and 1983, 
they had 23 presidents, and of those 23, 15 were military officers. Uh, in large part, they were mostly pretty repressive people, and in many ways, they destroyed Argentina's economy. It was pretty prosperous before World War II, but once the series uh, succession of military dictators took over and then committed a coup to overthrow the other guy to have them put in power, uh, they they became a lot less prosperous than they had been. Uh, there were lots of protests around Argentina against these governments, or against the government of Argentina, and it was a series of military dictatorships, uh, which ends up leading to massive repression against those protests. Uh, and that happens in the 1970s and through the 1980s, which also included are these uh, massive executions. A lot of people were being executed in Argentina for protesting the governments, and we get what's known as the generation of the disappeared, where these about 30,000 Argentin Argentinians who had been protesting were taken away by the secret police, the military police of the governments. And we get images like on the bottom right there next to my head of these people putting up the pictures of their family members in public places, uh, trying to find out where their, their loved ones had gone. And I'm going to include a little bit, a little clip uh, about these people who were disappeared because there are still marches today uh, by elderly women trying to find out where their husbands and children were disappeared too. And the last thing we'll say about Argentina here is that, remember I said we were going to come back and talk about Great Britain owning some territory? Well, there's this series of islands called the Falkland Islands just off the coast of Argentina, which Great Britain had owned since before the Monroe Doctrine was even a thing. And guys, they owned in air quotes. There's not much going on on these islands, but in 1982, uh, Great Britain, or uh, excuse me, Argentina decided that they wanted to take that back. Historically, it had been, it had been Latin American territory. Uh, so they decided they wanted to take that back and they invade the islands, which ca causes Margaret Thatcher and the British military to send in the troops. And they go in there and basically kick ass and take the island away and it ends up, uh, take the island back from the Argentinians and it ends up toppling the military dictatorship that had that was in charge in 1982. Uh, so that's the last thing we'll say about Argentina. And we'll move on to Costa Rica as kind of an uh, anomaly in Latin America because they avoided the dictatorships altogether. And it has to do with their independence movements going back uh, to that. There never was really a strong military in Costa Rica. They had abolished their military actually after a civil war in 1964. And so they ended up having this strong economic and democratic tradition, and to this day they remain strong uh, Democrats, not to say that they're members of the Democratic Party, but strongly against dictatorships and in favor of democracy. And I think Costa Rica is one of the more popular tourist destinations for Americans in Latin America today. Um, the next one we'll talk about, the next two countries actually, are Uruguay and Chile. And what we want to say about them is that they have democratic traditions, but they end up falling to military dictators anyway, uh, and for a number of reasons in both places that we don't have time to get super into today. Um, but they, they do have strong democratic traditions, but during this time where most of Latin America falls to, dem uh, to uh, military dictators, mostly because the United States was willing to support those dictators as long as they weren't communist, this is something that happens. So the next thing we're going to talk about here is Latin America in the 1980s, and we have to start by saying that there was this huge foreign debt crisis uh, beginning in 1981 when Mexico defaulted on a bunch of foreign debt loans that they had, uh, and it has to do with oil. What ended up happening was that Mexico discovered oil in Mexico in the 1970s. Uh, they make some money on it, but it was financed with foreign debts. Uh, it's okay because they have oil and the price of oil dropped in 1981, the Presidente ended up nationalizing banks and defaulted on the foreign payments uh, for those loans. A lot of people out thought that this would end up leading to a new Great Depression, uh, but the world at large decides that all of Latin America should have, to, should have to deal with this problem. So they make it a Latin America-wide problem by having the whole continent paid for it, the whole continent pay for it. Uh, they wouldn't loan, uh, in, international bankers wouldn't loan any money to Latin America unless they all agreed to pay for Mexico's foreign debt problem that they have here. And what this does is that it ended up leading uh, to the end of most military dictatorships in Latin America because the military dictators were blamed by the people 
for the economic problems in these countries. Uh, the Catholic Church had advocated that people should also be worried about social justice, and social justice was not one of the high points of uh, military dictatorships in Latin America. Uh, so we get these new governments forming in Latin America through the 1980s, and they face a number of problems. There was, for one, fragile economies bottoming out, uh, in a large part due to this foreign debt crisis uh, started by Mexico. Uh, civil society also was fragile, and what that means is that um, they're still dealing with human rights violations. A lot of the military police doesn't just go away overnight. They're still strong men in these countries. Uh, in large parts, but also these no new states face social divisions that had been tamped down by the military dictatorships, but when you're getting more and more democratic governments, these social divisions begin to reappear in ways that they hadn't before. And think of that like class divisions, not so much race, but a little bit of race in Latin America, but not as much as one would expect, like in North America, for example. Um, so that's another big issue. Uh, political conflict also increases in Central, mostly Central America in the 1980s. And we'll talk here about El Salvador, and we'll say that they had a dictatorship complete with military death squads, uh, and they ended up culminating in the assassination of this very popular archbishop. His name is Oscar Romero. Uh, it was a public execution. Uh, he was giving mass when he was executed by these uh, military dictatorship death squads. And what ended up happening was that they, uh, the El Salvadoran people got so angry that they tried to overthrow uh, the government because of this. I mean, this was just one of the very many. And on the bottom right here, you can see just some random dead bodies from these police squad executions. Um, and it has a very large effect on Central American society. Uh, the cost of overthrowing those dictatorships, uh, we'll say, was there was a population of 23 million or so in Central America. And hundreds of thousands out of those 23 million ended up being killed in uh, Central America at large, uh, which ended up leading to this huge immigration problem uh, from places like El Salvador and Guatemala. And here's uh, uh, immigration statistics to the United States. You can see uh, that Asia represents a large part. Mexico represents a large part. And this is from the 1990s. So that's not current. Um, hear Donald Trump talking a lot about today about the immigration problem from South America. Uh, with this immigration problem, you can debate whether or not it's real today or not. That's not history yet. Uh, but back into the 90s, that is history. So we can see that other Latin Americans, so it's a, a massive increase uh, from what it had been for a long time. And another big problem is that the economic problems turn a lot of South Americans, a lot of Latin Americans uh, to drug trafficking. Uh, Latin Americans figure they can get out of debt with illegal drugs, and it seems to be working to some extent. A lot of drug cartels have emerged in South America and a lot of places in South America, and it's not just a recent problem. Again, I'll talk about our current president, Donald Trump, uh, has been saying in the news a lot lately that uh, most, or should I say most, a lot of drugs are coming from Mexico, so that's part of why he wants to build this wall to keep the drugs out. And there's, you know, we don't have to get political about it. Uh, but back to the 1990s, the early 2000s, and before the, the late 1980s, think about things like uh, Scarface. And remember, Tony Montana had to get his drugs from Colombia. Colombia is known for cocaine, among other things. There's a lot of tourism there. Uh, and it's not as bad a country as it was in the late 80s and early 90s. Uh, the cartels don't control everything anymore. But a lot of drug traffic does come out of South America uh, to the United States, but also the rest of the world. And you can see I got a picture of some Border Patrol who seized a large shipment of drugs um, to the United States from some random cartel that was transporting it in. And that's kind of where Latin America sits today. They're trying to improve their economic situation, but still it takes a long time to overcome some of the problems that they've faced. Uh, they're recently, most Latin American countries are trying to become more democratic uh, and improve their economies, but it's a rather long process. So I want to say thanks for sticking with me for another one. And as has become custom at this point, because I don't think a lot of you are watching these, I want to give you five points if you watch this. So just send me an email saying I watched it uh, and uh, give me five points. All right. Thanks, guys. And don't share that with your with anybody else. I just want the people who actually watched because I want to know who's watching. I can tell from the view count how many people it isn't. But anyway, thank you, guys. Uh, I appreciate it. And I will see you uh, next time.